Good evening. We're going to call to order the Orange Township Board of Zoning Appeals meeting for January 28th, 2015. There's going to be a slight different uh, protocol this evening because uh, I have to be sworn in before I can conduct the meeting. So um, I have been reappointed by the trustees. Uh, I'll be sworn in and then we'll just proceed with the normal business of the meeting. We do have an alternate coming in, a new alternate, and later on uh, this evening we will swear her in. So. I, Thomas Reiniger. Solemnly swear that I will uphold. Solemnly swear that I will uphold. The Constitution and laws of the United States of America. The Constitution and laws of the United States of America. The Constitution and laws of the State of Ohio. The Constitution and laws of the State of Ohio. And the laws and resolutions of Coleraine Township. And the laws and resolutions of Coleraine Township. And that to the best of my ability. And that to the best of my ability. Will faithfully discharge the duties of a member of the Board of Zoning Appeals. Faithfully discharge the duties of a member of the Board of Zoning Appeals. In and for Coleraine Township. In and for Coleraine Township. Hamilton County. Hamilton County. State of Ohio. State of Ohio. So help me God. So help me God. That's longer than the President of the United States. It's a very important position to have here. Yes. Lisa. Need to be sworn in. Once again, good evening. Uh, we are going to begin the formal meeting with a uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So if you will stand and join me, we'll pledge allegiance. I'm going to review the procedures uh, for this evening so there is a, a general understanding of what uh, we are going to do and how we're going to do it. The sequence of events is as follows. Appeals will be heard first. Other business of the board will follow the hearing of the appeals. Uh, you're welcome to stay for the entire meeting but are not required to do so. All who speak or testify before the board will be sworn in. Uh, this may be done either as a group or individually. Anyone addressing the board is requested to use a speaker stand. Each person is asked to give his or her name uh, and address when first testifying. Our meetings are recorded and anyone speaking may be cross-examined by an attorney. All documents presented for each case may be accepted by the board. The chairman will rule whether additional items being offered will be accepted or rejected. The person presenting each case may also withdraw a document. Each case heard will first be presented by a staff member, usually the zoning administrator. And once the BZA staff presentation is complete, the appellant will have the opportunity to present their case. Following the appellant's presentation, the chairman will ask anyone opposed to the appeal to speak. And in some instances, time limits may be placed on those presentations. Next, the board will motion to close the public portion of the meeting 
and then individual board members will begin their questions. Board members will ask individuals who testify uh, to return to the speaker's podium. The decisions of the Board of Zoning Appeals for granting a non-use variance require the existence of a practical difficulty. There are several factors which will shape the decision of the Board. These factors may not be the only consideration, but represent the core of the decision. Does granting of this exception, one, adversely affect the delivery of government services, like water, sewage, garbage collection, that sort of thing? Does the granting of this exception devalue the adjoining properties? Does the granting of this exception increase or decrease the owner's property value? And is there a beneficial use of the property without the variance? Does denying of this exception place an undue burden on the property owner? Is the request related to a unique physical condition of the subject property? The alleged hardship or difficulty is not merely a request for a special privilege. And did the property owner purchase property with the knowledge of the zoning restrictions? Our deliberations for each case will focus on the facts presented by the staff and seek clarification in order to arrive at the best solution. We have to consider whether the spirit and an intent behind the zoning resolution would be observed and substantial justice be done by granting the variance. Following the board's questions, a motion and second will be made by the members of the board to either approve or deny the appeal. It is important to note that this vote is called a straw vote. This vote brings forth a resolution at next month's meeting, which is the final order of the board. Finally, respect for this process and one another is paramount. Deliberations for each case taken are taken seriously by the board and likewise is the expectation that respect will be accorded to everyone regardless of any emotion that may be involved. No disruptive behavior will be tolerated and this extends to all who have testified as well as members of the audience. Anyone being disruptive will be asked to leave the room. Thank you for your attention on that and we'll begin with our roll call. Mr. Price? Here. Mr. Bartolt? Here. Mr. Martin? Here. Mr. Roberto? Mr. Reininger? Present. At this point, with the absence of uh, Mr. Roberto, I will ask that uh, alternate uh, Don Kelly be seated. So, Mr. Kelly? And let the record reflect that Mr. Kelly is seated in Mr. Roberto's place. <coughs> now, for those who are testifying tonight, I will ask you to stand and raise your right hand to be sworn in. Anyone going to testify, please stand, raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in matters before the Board of Zoning Appeals? Say I do. Thank you all very much. All right, the first case tonight is BZA 2014-30. It's a variance for a wall signage. The location is uh, hometown urgent care 8459 Corrine Avenue and uh, you will know the board members will note there was an additional piece of correspondence uh, at your place regards to this um, so they have presentation all right good evening um, so the applicant is uh, Tommy Reed on behalf of hometown urgent care uh, currently uh, hometown urgent care is um, is uh, open and they do have a sign on the east elevate or on the east elevation um, what they're here for is to add another sign on the you may want to move closer to the microphone to add a sign on the south elevation um, of the building which does not face the public or private street uh, the so the the south elevation of the building does, however, face an entrance drive to the, the Coleraine Hills Shopping Center and thus serves as a pedestrian entrance to the urgent care. Uh, the entrance drive runs east to west and terminates at a right in, right out Coleraine Avenue intersection. Um, here's just an aerial shot of uh, the hometown urgent care. Um, in yellow is their space and in red is uh, just showing the south elevation where they would like to have their wall sign um, put up. 
It's currently zoned B2. And this is the signage proposal. Um, they're allowed to have 40 points, 40.7 square feet of uh, 40.7 square feet of uh, signage, and they're only proposing 39.74 square feet. Some of the staff findings. Uh, one, the variance requested is not substantial. If a variance were to be granted, the amount of wall signage would be in keeping with the one square foot per linear foot of building frontage. Two, the property in question would likely yield a reasonable return without the variance because other pro properties in the district that conform with the zoning resolution do yield a reasonable return. Three, the owner's predicament could be feasibly, could not be feasibly obviated by other means. Without the variances, the owner will not be able to install any signage on the south facade. The variance would not adversely affect the delivery of governmental services. Five, the essential character of the neighborhood would not be neg negatively impacted. And six, whether the owner knew about the zoning regulations when they purchased the property is unclear. Seven, by taking into consideration the benefit to the applicant if the variance is granted as weighed against the detriment to the health, safety, and welfare of the neighborhood and broader community, staff finds that substantial justice would be done by granting this variance. The staff recommends approval. Thank you. Is the applicant here? Hi, my name is Tommy Reed. I'm with Atlantic Sign Company. Address is 2328 Florence Avenue, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45206. Um, basically, uh, what, what we would like to do, uh, as Julia stated, thank you for putting that together, is put a storefront sign on the front of the building. We do have currently a sign on the east elevation facing Coleraine Avenue. Could you pull up that sign map? <clears throat> if, you, um, if you look at where the ingress and egress road is, there's a parking lot. On the other side of that, there is another outbuilding that holds multiple retailers. Those retailers have storefront signs as well as signs that face Coleraine Avenue. One of those retailers faces the ingress egress road to the plaza there. It has a storefront sign and a sign on the side elevation. And I'd just like to talk to you as a father. I have four children, okay? When they get the flu or when they have a broken bone, I mean, this place offers many services. You know, you can get a little frazzled. If I think of my wife taking four kids, you know, to a newly open business, maybe, maybe not be familiar with the area. You know, it can be a little bit, she can get a little frazzled, a little stressful. Um, I just think it would make it much more easily to identify where she's supposed to go in that time. <coughs> not only do they offer emergency <coughs> services, they um, offer drug testing, uh, wellness checks, uh, basically everything that you could go to your primary care physician for uh, but just with convenience of not having an appointment and being being able to get in and in and out quickly. Um, so, if this sign was allowed, it would not pose any harm uh, to the greater public or any other business. Um, and that's that's pretty much it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else speak in favor? Anyone to speak in opposition? Seeing none opposition, I'll ask for a board motion to close the public input. So moved. I moved. Motion is made as a second. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. We'll begin with four questions. Mr. Martin. <clears throat> um, I think this is kind of a no-brainer. I think we should approve it. Um, I just one quick question. Is the total area for both signs still within the, the parameters of the of the? Yeah. One square foot per one linear foot, yes. And, and I'm, I, I live very near there, and uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, Radio Shack and um, the eyeglass place, they all have signs. Um, it just seems to make sense. I, I don't see any, any reason why you shouldn't be able to do it, so I intend to vote yes. <laughs> it's a very nice-looking sign, if I might okay. add. It's not gaudy or out of alignment with what's there. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Mr. Price. No questions. Mr. Barfield. Uh No questions. I guess really we're just, though, bringing this up because if it's not a public right-of-way or a public street basically 
Yeah, so it's a driveway, so it's not classified as a private or public street. However, it is front, it, it's the front of the building for the pedestrian. Okay, yeah, no question. Mr. Kelly. I do have, I've got two questions. Um, one is, like, is the, the, the picture that's on here, is this approximately to scale? Yes, sir. Okay. And then my next question, I think, would be for administration. So if we allow this, this would, this would go with uh, any other uh, vendor or uh, shopkeeper that could come in there. I just would hate to allow it and see another checks cashed here sign go up there. Can we, can, is there a way to limit it to where only can be uh, a medical use? It, it, yeah, it, it would run with the variance runs with the with the property, um, but it couldn't be a check cashing place right now because there's a moratorium in place that prevents those types of uses from uh, from coming in. How from long is that moratorium for? A year. And so then, well, and, and the purpose of the moratorium is to allow us to come up with um, a regulatory scheme for those for those types of, of uses. So, hopefully, we'll have a situation in place where. Um, your concern about the check cashing place would not be in well the signage I, sh I certainly don't mind it for health care but I, I would be concerned about it for tattoos or, or other things that, runs with the yeah so and we can't limit it to saying yes you can do it with with just uh for health care um, type companies can't, that can't be done it just has to be part launch kind of. I don't believe so okay thank you I forgot to add, if you don't mind, the previous tenant did have a storefront sign in place there, I found out. It's just a couple of quick questions from the chair. The uh, handicap accessible parking is where located? Is it located in front or on the side of that building? I believe it's uh, the front. Um, facing Coleraine or facing entrance? Facing the entrance, if you look at the two center spots there, yep. those would be the handicapped parking spots. The other question is, do you anticipate a need for uh, life squad access in there? Will the doors accommodate this? <clears throat> With the nature of the business, I would not anticipate the need of a life squad. Uh, an emergency that severe, they would probably transport them directly to the hospital. Thank you. No other questions from the board? I move that we approve it. Is there a second? I'll second. Any other discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Price? Aye. Mr. Bartolt? Yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Roberto? <laughs> Mr. Reininger. Mr. Reininger, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, very Thank good. You very and much. the variance has been approved. Thank you. Thank you. Next case is BZA 2014 31. It's a conditional use for an educational facility in a residential district. And uh, also, part of that is BCA. Oh, well, I guess we have to split that. Um, there's an additional flyer. It was at uh, our places when we came in. And the location is 5906 Springdale Road, Cincinnati, Ohio. Question for staff. We have two different appeals. Do we take them each separately? So first, we'll do the area variance for the setback, the uh, side, the setbacks. And then if that's approved, uh, we can go on to the conditional use. So you want to do the setback one first? We'll do that one first. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> so um, this is an area variance for an educational facility in a residential district. Uh, and um, the setback, setback variance for an existing structure. The map. The, uh, in the matter of the appeal of Christian Fraley on behalf of Precious Years Learning Center, for an area variance related to setback requirements of 50 feet from all lot lines when located within or adjacent to a residential, di residential district, the applicant proposes to conduct their educational facility in the building where it resides. The building is non-conforming due to the fact that it is currently deficient by approximately 37 feet from the western lot line. The parking areas are also deficient to the setback requirement by approximately 43 feet from the northern lot line five feet from the southern lot line and 50 feet from the western lot line. The total scope of the project would include interior alterations set in separate phases and new signage. Here's an aerial map of the site and uh, what I mean is the, the here's the western lot line. This is um, the building so it sits pretty close. It's all residential. It's all the same district. 
Staff findings include, one, the building is currently non-conforming as it relates to required setbacks. Two, the character of the neighborhood would not be substantially altered by the issuance of the variance. Three, this property would likely continue to sit vacant given the combination of both the use restrictions for the residential district and the building structure and size. It's currently a church, or it was a church. Four, the re relocating the driveway into the property to the eastern side of the building would alleviate the close proximity of the current driveway to the neighboring business. Five, due to the shape of the lot, configuration of the building on the lot and existing non-conforming status, the proposed project would not be possible without a variance. The adjoining properties would not suffer a substantial detriment as a result of the variance because the building that impinges on the setback currently exists and is not proposed to change. Six, the variance would not adversely affect the delivery of governmental services and staff recommends approval of the project. So since we're going to split this, um, let's see if the, is there someone here to represent um, this appeal? Hi, my name is Christine Fraley. Um, I'm owner of Precious Years Learning Center Limited, and I reside at 3641 Ben Hill Drive, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45247. Um, we're here to... Um, request approval of the variance for the um, setback limitations. Um, our educational center um, would be in a residential area. Um, we believe that that conforms with um, uh, the uh, condition of use, and that's a separate, entirely separate thing that I believe we're going to split up. Is that correct? OK. Um, this uh, variance request is not contrary to the public interest in any way. The West uh, property border is the property line um, that borders with an existing small business, and our business would not have a negative impact on that business, um, nor would that business have any negative impact on ours as an educational facility. Um, a literal enforcement of the boundary lines would basically be impossible. Um, the only way to really comply with the boundaries uh, difficulties would be to um, have the variance issued so that the project could continue. Um, there is the possibility of re uh, moving the driveway to the east side of the lot, and thereby it would um, allevi alleviate the problem of when you turn left out of the lot going north, on to Springdale, there's a little rise in the red there. Um, and if we moved the entryway to face Gaines Road, it would be uh, a little bit easier, and that would eliminate some of the problem with the western border, uh, the western boundary. Um, but this noncompliance um, is not a result of anything that, um, that the applicant or owner has done or um, anything like that. These are just um, uh, zoning rules that were in place um, after the conditional, the former conditional use had expired. And so we would uh, therefore res respectfully request a variance be issued um, for these, uh, these boundary matters. Thank you. I want to make sure we're clear on our questioning. So we're going to talk about not the conditional use, but the request for the boundary <coughs> variance approval of that. And, right. Yes, yeah, so it, as a condition, so the, it has to meet certain conditions in order to get a conditional use approval, and it doesn't because it's non-conforming currently. So we're going to be granting a variance to one of the conditions. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And is there anyone else speak in favor of this? Anyone speak in opposition? This vote. All right, then I'll ask for a motion to close public part. So moved. Second. Question, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so we'll begin with questions from the board. Start with Mr. Martin. So I just want to make sure I understand. You're basically going to take this church and turn it into a school primarily, right? Yes. But so the interior is going to be completely gutted? No, we will not make any um, changes unless it's required by Hamilton County. Um, currently, it's a, s a small sanctuary on okay. the right side, and the, the former church is taking the pews with them. 
Right. Um, so really, there's there's nothing that we need to do uh, to make any changes on the interior or the exterior unless it's deemed appropriate by regulations. Well, and I don't want to stray, and I'll look to counsel over that. I don't want to stray out of our jurisdiction, but sort of like the questions that Mr. Reiner just asked the, the previous applicant, I looked at the, the interior stuff, and I know that we're focusing on the exterior, but there's only one bathroom, or two bathrooms, I guess. And you're talking <coughs> bathrooms for all these people. Yes, there's two bathrooms in there, um, and that would be something that we would address with um, Hamilton County Building Committee. Um, but that's something we can't do until we have this variance issue. So in other words, this care. would all be, there wouldn't be any objection to us conditioning on this on approval by Hamilton County, correct? Uh, you could do that, but they have to get approval in order okay. to get a building permit or certificate of. And they're very stringent. I know about for right. educational facilities anyway. So that, that it just sort of struck me that you know I looked at the interior and I said, oh, "Where are all these right. kids going to go to the bathroom?" Exactly, and and there's uh, other things that we could put in, and it, it may be in their recommendations, such as a wash station. Right. A lot of the elementary schools have those, and so then that frees up the bathrooms for those that actually need the facilities, and then you have the ones doing the hand washing in a separate area and the access um, and the, the ingress and the, I know that certain kind of I uh, have to have access through the windows and all that kind of stuff correct um, and there's um, three uh, I spoke with Mark Walsh um, fire right um, he said there should be there needs to be at least two ways in and out and there's three um, it's one level um, so we don't have to worry about that in other words correct yeah cool um, yeah, I guess the only other question I would have then is um, I think moving the driveway sounds like a great idea. Um, are there other conditions, though, that we should be thinking about that kind of minimizes impact? Because these variances are rather extreme. I mean, the, the uh, in one case it's uh, 50 feet. Uh, I think 43 feet. Uh, I mean, isn't additional shrubbery or landscaping? Wouldn't that be appropriate, Jeff, to uh, to kind of mollify this a little bit? You could do that. I would think that we'd want to do something along those lines to um, make, and I don't know if it comes up here or in the next issue, but I, I would think that we'd want to put some conditions on here that, that you need to do something with the landscaping to do whatever you can to, uh, to take this detriment away, you know, in terms of the, the sure. boundaries. But that's pretty much all I have. Mr. Price? A question about the existing driveway. Is that going to be completely removed and resodded, or are you going to leave that driveway there? Um, well, that would be entirely up to um, what uh, your recommendations would be. Um, I personally think that if we had one as an exit and one as an entrance, it might be best. The one that's existing could maybe be an entrance. Um, of course, if there's some landscaping requirements, that might just go away you know maybe that's where the landscaping boundary should be um, to define the property line um, we we could do either way we could move the driveway east and then have that as an in and out and make it wide enough for that or we could do an in where it is existing and then an exit by Gaines Road okay that's really all I have uh -huh. Um, so yeah, on the drive. So you are proposing, regardless of the outcome, to move the driveway, or is that only if you're forced to? Um, I look to your recommendations. Um, I can, I'm, I'm open to whatever you feel would be safest for the community because you know they're transporting small children. You know, um, so we want to do what is safest, and and that is not really my line of work so whatever you guys would recommend to be safest is what we could put in for the um, variance condition and then we'll make sure it happens but deleting the existing driveway doesn't help our building being 26 feet away from the western correct. plot line but it doesn't solve correct the issue okay um, <clears throat> so the, uh, this property has been in this configuration for quite a while hasn't it Yes. Okay. And the adjoining the adjoining property to the uh, to the west is that kind of not a uh, was a gas station. Right. Now that's a body shop. Helcher's body shop. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so um, yeah, I don't think I have any other questions. Mr. Kelly, uh, I have a couple. Mm -hmm. um, 
one I, I think I remember reading that the, uh, the the maximum of uh 50 people in the auditorium area and in some of the paperwork do you have uh how many students do you think you're going to have and, and staff uh, we currently have 40 on our license where we are now we have um, eight staff of course they're not there all, all day right. um, it's like a split shift so okay um, we do below ratios um, we do a lot of small group so I don't envision more than 50 children at the most and we're at 40 now and we could just use a little bit more space right. and yeah and then uh, I think um, uh, do you run a normal school year, a nine-month year, or a 12-month? We run a normal school year. Uh -huh. um, we follow usually follow Northwest Local School District. Okay. Um, and because the children in our care, they're, they're um, needing after-school care, before-school care, we do offer summer program. Um, so we run that kind of like uh, you would see a VBS, and we do science activities, um, all kinds of extended learning. Um, some of our children need some help before they go off to kindergarten or maybe they're in a grade level and they are needing some reading tutoring so we provide lots of services through the summer yeah. that they can get um and so still have one's place yes it will be open all year round okay mm -hmm. and then uh I, is there a um uh with with the type of school that you have you know we you have the 20 mile an hour signage uh no we do not have that requirement that. that's good yeah yeah I guess good and bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, I think uh, I think that's really all I've got. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just a question from Chair. It, it is a vacant building at this point, isn't it? Yes, it is. Vacant building. And uh, how long has it been vacant? Uh, several years, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the uh, question you raised to us about ingress and egress uh, traffic patterns are pretty much in an engineering um, call perhaps even an educational call I think that would be um, outside of our purview to recommend but certainly would be worth uh, investigating to see which is the safest and what yes I agree what the educational people would uh, have to say about that okay uh, no other comments from the board. I'll ask for a motion to approve or deny. Just a, I guess just yeah. a quick question in terms of procedure, because I, I do think that um, we probably ought to put something in there about the landscaping. I don't think okay. we can sit here tonight, though, and dream up a landscaping scheme. Um, so I would like to see if we could have you submit something. In other words, sure. we could give you conditional approval tonight, subject to you submitting um, a landscaping plan because I think the landscaping plan is probably going to have to be integrated into whatever educational requirements are out there because you're probably going to have to fence some of the area outside is that not yeah right? and that'll be um, the final phase of all of our approvals that we get right. um, from this step we go to Hamilton County then we go to fire right. and then finally state licensure um, and she will come out and look at the property and walk it and determine if we need just a gate if we're using the back lot and no cars are going back there if we just need a gate or if we need a fence and one other point is that um, before you get to building department for the for their uh, review and approval you'll have to get a, a, a zoning certificate correct and the zoning certificate would be a change of use zoning certificate right. and uh, there are landscaping and buffering requirements in the zoning resolution so that's what I'm getting at I mean how can we make this so that it makes sense for her and she doesn't have to come back here so um, I guess what I'm saying is as part of our review for the zoning certificate there are landscaping standards that are in our zoning resolution and okay. so she would have to submit a landscaping plan along with a parking plan a lighting plan um, site plan um, and that would have to be shown and she'd have to demonstrate compliance with the zoning resolution before you move on to correct mm -hmm. we don't have to worry about it right now that's, that would <laughs> that's be my fine. suggestion yeah that's good, good. All right. so, uh, Ma'am, if if you wish to address the board, you need to come up to the podium. He needs to be sworn. Were you uh, were you sworn in? Please. Did you were you sworn in? No. Uh, please raise your right hand. You swear or affirm that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in matters before the board of zoning appeals. Say I do. I do. Please state your name and address, please. Carol Pot, sixty-eight zero eight Thompson Road. And my concern, if I understand right, she wants to move the driveway directly almost across from Gaines Road. Am I right? That is that is a point of discussion, but not yeah. final. Right. 
my concern is the traffic on Springdale Road and coming out of Gaines Road onto Springdale. We've lived out here 51 years. I know that there have been some fatalities, not a lot of them, but there have been. I myself have almost been hit because people come down Springdale Road around the cemetery and you're all, you have to kind of pull out to be able to see. And I'm concerned that that will be a traffic problem and also for the children. Good. Thank you for that comment. All right. So are you in favor of this project or against the project? Or are you just want to make sure that the engineer looks at the access issue? I want to make sure that the children are safe. And the pedestrian and the people, the joggers that run there. Right. If you and, if you wish to respond, you need to come back up. I just want to make sure that the pedestrians, the uh, cars, buses, whatever, that leave the people on and off, the traffic that, because that gains is used a lot to get around the White Oak uh, traffic. <laughs> you know, down gains up Jessup, and, and you miss a lot of it. And it is traveled a lot. And like I said, over the 51 years that I've been there, I have almost been hit a number of times because you have to pull out in to the intersection a lot to be able to view your right-hand side. And it concerns me that if the driveway is directly across, it's going to create problems. Thank you. Any, anyone else speak either in favor or in opposition? I have another comment or question. Okay, well. another comment from the board. Ma'am, if you don't mind. Uh, just, just to confirm what I thought, thought I read, there are no school buses here, right? This is strictly families dropping children off? There are a few school buses for if we have um, some children that are in preschool and they have an older sibling that have gone through our program and they're now in um, first or second grade and they need some before care or they need transportation. So we have one bus that transports to Coleraine Elementary currently and then that bus also returns them late in the afternoon. And that's a standard full-size bus? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we're at a point where we need a board action either to approve or deny. I just have one last question. Do you own the property or are you leasing the property? Um, currently, I am in limbo. <laughs> yeah. um, financing's all set um, and that I am considered the owner, but the finance, the Huntington Bank does not want me to uh, go any further until I have my approvals in order. Okay. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you're ready. I'll make a yeah. motion to approve the variance as written. Okay. I second. And we'll do a roll call vote on this one of two variants. Okay, Sunday. Yeah. Conditional use. Not conditional the use. The variance. Setbacks. Setback. Okay. So roll call. Mr. Price? Yes. Mr. Bartold? Yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Reininger? Yes. Now we're going to do 2014-31 conditional use. I think it's 32. 32. Ms. Brodsky, that microphone simply doesn't work. Either that or... It just, it just wasn't on. So we can now move on to the conditional use approval, and this is based on the zoning resolution article 7.4.5 for educational facilities. Um, all buildings, activity areas, and parking areas shall be located a minimum of 50 feet from all lot lines when located within or adjacent to a residential zoning district. So again, this is the aerial shot, zoning, in staff findings, uh, one, the use is a conditional use permitted with approval by the Board of Zoning Appeals in the district where the subject lot is located. Two, the use is in accordance with the objectives of the Coleraine Township Comprehensive Plan and Zoning Resolution. Three, the conditional use will not substantially and or permanently inquire the, injure the appropriate use of the neighboring properties and will serve the public conven convenience and welfare. Four, the use has not and will not create excessive requirements at public cost for public facilities and services and will not be detrimental to the economic welfare of the community. Staff recommends approval. I'll move that we uh, grant the conditional use approval. 
I'll second. Should should there be a uh, public? Oh, okay. On both. Right. Yeah. We, we don't really need. To Got it. Fully back up. All right. So motion's been made and seconded. Additional discussion by the board. To a roll call vote then. Mr. Price. Yes. Mr. Bartolt. Yes. Mr. Martin. Yes. Mr. Kelly. Yes. Mr. Reininger. All right. So both uh, variances have been a conditional use and the setback variance have been approved. Thank you. Good luck. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> so we, the next uh, case is BZA 2014-33. It's a setback variance for a deck in a side yard. The location is 10889 Gosling Road. And staff presentation, please. All right. Well, the owners are the applicants, Andy and Peggy McCarthy. They live over at 10889 Gosling Road. They bought the house. Uh, it's currently non-conforming. And um, this area variance is uh, based on Article 10, Section 10.2.1 of the zoning resolution related to location of an accessory building in the R2 residential zoning district. The applicant proposes to add an additional section to an existing deck that would extend along the side of the home to the rear yard. Single family home is currently deficient by three feet in the side yard and the existing deck is non-conforming due to the fact that it is located in the side yard. The applicant's proposed addition is aligned with the existing deck in that the proposed deck does not protrude any further into the side yard setback than the existing deck already does. There's an aerial shot. It's um, very wooded over there. It has lots of dense trees. Currently, the deck, there's an existing deck in the front yard that swoops around to the eastern side. <coughs> Currently zoned R2. And here's just a little graphic showing the current deck and what they propose. Um, it's not to scale, uh, but they propose to wrap it around the back. Staff findings include one, the building is currently non-conforming as it relates to the required side yard setbacks not less than 20 feet for homes without sewer in the R2 residential district. The property in question would likely yield a reasonable return without the variance. The variance requested is not substantial. The character of the neighborhood would not be substantially altered by the issuance of the variance. The variance would not adversely affect the delivery of governmental services. And six, the owners were not aware of the setback requirements when they purchased the property, nor did they think there would be any issues to adding to the existing deck. And lastly, fit to the applicant if, sorry, um, <coughs> the, the detriment to the health, safety, and welfare of the neighborhood and broader community staff, staff finds that substantial justice would not be done by granting this variance. Staff recommends approval. Thank you. Is the uh, owner here? Good evening. Hello. My name's Andy McCarthy and my wife, Peggy McCarthy. We currently reside at 10889 Gosling Road. Um, I think they pretty much explained it. <laughs> uh, we currently have three children and we'd like to wrap the deck around the back so that we can sit on the deck and watch our children play in the backyard. Um, like she said, it's heavily wooded. Um, we're hoping maybe this increases the value somewhat if we eventually sell one day. Um, we have spoken to the closest neighbor there just to see if it would be an inconvenience for them and they've signed a document here for us stating that it's no big deal to them. Hmm. Okay. Um, anything else you want to add? No, sir. Okay. Uh, I don't see anyone here to speak in opposition, so we'll just close the public part of this. So moved. Go to the board. Second. So moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Martin. Um, again, I think this is sort of in the no-brainer category, but because there's lots of ways you can justify this with a wooded um, view and so on and so forth. I don't think it's going to really be a problem. I'm curious though the original deck was approved is that was that by your predecessor Jeff I don't know you don't have any other information on uh, past permits but not. 
Okay. So we bought the house with the deck already constructed. Right. And you were un you're under the impression that it was approved though the previous deck. It was a foreclosure. Oh. Purchase, okay. So we don't really I mean the, the um. I think we I think as a board we do try to approach the residential areas differently than businesses in terms of variances and and again I think there's ample justification to distinguish this situation from others so I would intend to vote in favor of the variance mr. price I only have one question on on the uh, I'm gonna assume you guys sort of drew that okay is there a reason that you're going over toward the the closest neighbor versus going around the opposite side just to continue off the current we're just trying to kind of connect it all together. Right, so why can't there's they come actually, this way around? Um, the existing deck, there's steps that go up that side, oh, right, and we jump. have a door there. So it's I'm sorry, say that again. I... Ms. Ms. McCarthy, I just speak your name and address because uh, your husband has in heaven. Peggy McCarthy, 10889 Gosling Road. Thank you. Um, on our existing deck, we actually have steps on the right side of the house that lead up to that deck. So it would just kind of connect it all together. Okay. Can I, can I ask a question? Are, are we, we're closer to this neighbor. Right, where you want to put the deck, right? Yeah. yeah. So my question is, why not put it on the opposite side so you wouldn't need the variance? Oh, okay. So the, the other side of the, of the house has a sunroom on that, that side. And... Like she said, the steps already lead up to the house, so we just want to continue it. And continue this thing. you can look right into their house. Right. The people on that side, you can't see that house there, but we're on a huge hill. And you can't actually see the house that's closest to us because of how thick the woods are. So it's actually more private to where on the left side and looking out of our sunroom, you actually see directly into that house that's down the hill. A ways um, gotcha. on that side even though it's farther away it's the trees just don't block it enough it's not a stick gotcha. okay that's the only question I had this price I uh, no questions really no questions then from the chair so at this point we will ask for a motion. move that we approve the variance there a second second question from the board or question we'll call vote Mr. Price Yes. Mr. Bartolt? Yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Reininger? Aye. Okay, very approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go to Sullivan. We are going to go down to the agenda. We have no resolutions from last month, so there's no resolutions to adopt. No unfinished business. We do have minutes from the 17th of December. And. Uh, Motion to approve the minutes. I can't find that. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. I second. Discussion? <coughs> any, any, okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Administrative matters. Uh, number 10, we have uh, BZA rules and procedures, and the um, comment is to amend Article uh, 7. And uh, Barbary, I think you're going to address that. Yes, I'll be happy to address that. And let me start first <clears throat> with the issue about what an abstention should mean and why we're talking about making it a little more clear in the bylaws as to the effect of an abstention on a vote. Um, the way courts have generally interpreted abstentions is that an abstention is counted with the majority. And so if you have a situation where the vote is two for, two against, and there's one abstention, then you don't have three concurring votes as it's required in the um, zoning resolution, and consequently they won't pass since there's no majority. And I think that's fair enough. I mean, obviously it's a tie vote and there's no majority, so that's, you know, I don't know that there's any reason to change that. But the situation, I think, becomes a little muddy if the vote is two in favor, one against, and one abstention. And the reason I think it gets muddy in that situation is that your zoning resolution says the board shall act by resolution when three members concur. Well, if the vote is two, one, and one, 
three members aren't really concurring. And there's a case that I found in preparing for, you know, in looking over this language, it's called a Buck Holly versus the Ohio State of, um, Board of Pharmacy. And they talk about, in this case, the fact that the rules of the board said that there had to be a majority of the members that agreed um, on the vote. And a majority, there were nine members on the uh, board, so a majority meant five had to vote. And what the court said is, with the board consisting of a total of nine members, it is patently clear that a majority constitutes at least five members. The issue here arises in light of the fact that the board president does not vote on matters unless there is a tie in the vote. Appellant's argument is that the revocation of his license was not approved by a majority of the board, citing the fact that four members voted yes, three voted no, and one member abstained. The ninth member, the board president, did not vote since there was no tie. So in that case, that's exactly the same situation that we have with our zoning resolution that say three members have to concur. So my fear is, is that if we have a vote with two in favor of, one against, and one abstention, then we don't have a concurrence, or at least there's a question as to whether we have three members concurring. And I, I wouldn't have brought this up except for the fact that I represented the village of Waynesville in a case where involving their zoning commission where the same issue arose and it ended up being a full-blown litigation. So since the courts will give deference to the way we define how, a, how an abstention is counted in our regulations, I thought it might make some sense to clean that up. So that's why I proposed that particular change. And I will say that particular change was my um, suggestion. It wasn't Jeff's. Jeff's. The other one was Jeff's. So at any rate, that's why I suggested that change. As I understand the reason for the other abstention, for the other change, and that is that um, once someone participates in deliberations, they shouldn't abstain. The way I construe deliberations is deliberations occur after the hearing is closed, and you're actually talking about making a vote. That's the way both the First Appellate District of Ohio, the Ohio Supreme Court, and the Twelfth Appellate District in the context of the Sunshine Law, that's the way they define deliberations. Deliberations isn't gathering information. It's not the give and take where you're asking people questions, getting information. Deliberations actually involves you speaking with each other and starting to form a decision as to how you're going to vote. Normally, when people abstain from a vote, they do it because they don't feel it would be fair for them to vote. It's usually because of some conflict of interest. From my perspective, it makes sense that if someone believes they have a conflict of interest, it's okay for them to participate in the information gathering and asking questions because that may be how they find out they have a conflict of interest. But once all that's done and they're, start, and they're part of the deliberative process and you are talking amongst each other and giving reasons why you should vote for or against, well, someone who has a conflict of interest probably shouldn't be participating at that point. So I think those are the reasons, um, from my perspective, for the changes that have been suggested to the um, your bylaws. Okay. Comments from the board? Questions? Anybody? Well, I have, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, again, I, as I said in the emails that we exchanged on Monday, I think this is a problem, a solution in search of a problem. Um, my research has shown me that this whole issue of a board member abstaining uh, after the discussion started has occurred once in the two years I've been on the board and zero times in the preceding years. Um, I have less of a problem with the notion that you want to clarify in the, in the uh, ordinance what the effect of an, of an abstention is, but I have, I have distinct problems with the notion that a board member has to vote. Um, that, that just seems to me contrary to logic um, and, and frankly, to, to good governance. Um, I just don't think there's any reason why I've read the, the case law. Um, the, one, the one instance where I did abstain, I gave my reasons for abstaining. Um, I, I thought they were pretty clear at the time. 
Uh, I knew what the effect would be of the abstention, which is that, that um, my abstention would count with the majority, which is why I said at the last meeting that it was an effective de facto yes vote, not a de facto no vote. Um, the case law is from 1958. Uh, the zoning ordinance has been written, revised, revised again since 1958 numerous times. Never ever has this been an issue. I don't purport to be up on all the zoning literature the way I'm sure you are, Mr. Barbieri, but I haven't seen this as a, an issue in any uh, literature that I've read. Um, so I guess I'm just left to question why we need to put this language in there. I know that the case law suggests that, you know, once you serve on a board, you have an obligation to, to vote or you have an obligation to act. I don't think anybody is suggesting anybody on this board doesn't take the, their job seriously, doesn't spend an adequate or probably more than an adequate amount of time preparing for these meetings and participates vigorously. And since I'm the only one that abstained, I don't think anybody I mean, I may have some critics on the board, but I don't think anybody would suggest that I don't prepare for these meetings so, and, and take the job seriously. So I, I guess I just don't understand why we have to bring up this whole issue of having to vote. I mean, using your example, um, first of all, Ohio law would trump anything we said in our, in our um, zoning ordinance anyway. So if the zoning ordinance if the, uh, the Ohio uh, case that law that was cited, the 1958 case, it says very clearly the common law is followed in Ohio, and in common law, uh, an, ab an abstention is counted with the majority. If our zoning ordinance says something about, you know, having a, a needing a concurrence, well, it's going to be trumped by that particular judicial decision anyway. Correct? No. Um, Why? Well, first, I'll tell you, the case I just read to you right. that said if it was four in favor, three against, with one abstention, right. was not a majority of the members because the abstention didn't count with the majority. I understand, I understand that. But so let me finish. Okay. That case was decided in 2006, right. which is the same year the zoning resolution went into practice. So in light of the reasoning, in light of the language in our zoning resolution, I thought that case was very close to the language in our zoning resolution, and it concerns me that, you know, it may be that a court would decide a 2-1-1 vote would mean that there was no majority vote, there weren't three members concurring. With respect to your statement that Ohio law would trump anything we put in our bylaws, the reason I suggested the change is that there are cases that say if we put something in our bylaws that say what we do with an abstention, the courts will give deference to that. And I'll cite you to the case of Betio versus Village of Northfield, where the court said, we find nothing that would prevent a local community from establishing a contrary rule to govern its own council proceedings when they were talking about how to define an abstention. So I thought, with respect to that issue, if we just define an abstention as being with the majority, except that if it's 2-4-1, if it's 2-1-1, it counts with the majority, and therefore we have three concurring votes, then we alleviate that problem before we get to it. And as I said on Monday, and that's why I'm... I'm, I'm I'm distressed that we're even spending any time on this. I have no problem with that. If you want to spell that out in the, okay. I, I don't think it's necessary. I think that you know what all you're doing is really clarifying what what everybody understands the rule to be anyway. But if that if if you want to put that in there, fine. The objection I have is the furtherance or the further statement that you want to make that every member has to vote, that a member can't abstain because I, I think you're you're asking to draw a, a false line in terms of when deliberations stop and when, when voting starts, um, you're just going to force somebody to vote no. Uh, if, you're, if they're abstaining, they're not going to vote yes. Um, so it's not going to have any effect whatsoever uh, in terms of, of switching the vote around. So again, I have no problem whatsoever. If you, if you, I'll defer to you as counsel, if you think that that clarification in terms of the effect of an abstention is necessary in the zoning ordinance, Go for it. Put it in there. Be my guest. But it's the second statement that I have strong objection to, and I hope that the board understands what 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 I'm saying here. I'm not. This isn't a you know. I'm not trying to have a, a personal you know contest between me and anybody else here. I'm just saying that I think as a matter of course, this has happened once in 20 years that I'm aware of, 
Um, and when it happened, we knew what the result would be, at least I knew what the result would be. Uh, I think we now are, are clear what the result will be, put it in the ordinance and be done with it. But do not require that everybody vote no matter what. Okay, from my perspective, what I would suggest to the board is I believe it's important that you put that you change the bylaws to reflect the effect of an abstention when you have the 211. As far as whether someone who's going to abstain should deliberate or not, that's up to you. I don't think from a legal perspective that's as an important an issue and that's just a matter of policy as to how you want to run your meetings and I think that's totally up to how you feel about it. I think we're I think we have found mutual understanding. Make the change like the abstention. Correct. Well, I'll make a motion, I guess. Then I guess if, I'd like to. Maybe we should bifurcate this because I have a question on the other issue. But let's deal with the abstention issue. I, I move that we uh, amend the. I guess these are the rules, right? Are these the rules we're amending or the bylaws? Uh, the bylaws. bylaws. Okay. I move that we amend the bylaws uh, to reflect the effect of an abstention, but we do not amend the bylaws to uh, mandate that uh, a member vote if they participate in the deliberations. Let's, let's split that even further. Let's, <laughs> let's handle the abstention. All right. And then the voting is, so, I think, in a separate issue. So let's, let's keep it clean. And All right, say, that's fine. Say that I have no problem. With that. The, the abstention falls with the majority. That, that's that, fine. And let's also keep in mind that there's a, a, a change to the bylaws that would remove the need for resolutions and switch over to a motion based system. So that's that's the most important one. That's fine. From my perspective. <coughs> so we have motion second. I second that. Okay. Discussion? So okay <laughs> I'm clear. You, okay, this, so maybe the a, motion deals with abstentions falling to the majority. Right. And the um, use of the resolution Restate that, Jeff. I believe the motion, as I understand it, is um, to amend the bylaws in all ways except, in all ways that were proposed, except the, um, except the sentence, should a board member participate in deliberations, that board member shall vote on a case and shall not abstain. Okay, except for, the, and that's why I wanted to bifurcate, because the, the stuff that I received in the mail over the weekend on the second issue, on the resolution and it has the old language in it. So I want to make sure we're, we know what we're voting on because that has language in it about the date of the approval of the minutes of the meeting at which the motion was made shall be the date of adoption. And we changed that, if you'll recall. The date of adoption. The Remember, because we, we took that language out at the last meeting because that, that is diametrically opposed to what you want to accomplish here. No, wait a minute. Um, where are you at? I'm talking about the blue, the blue highlighting that we received in the mail. What, uh, what part uh, of the blue highlight? Under, under E, the second paragraph that starts, a motion shall be made. Article E. A motion shall be made pursuant to the instructions above within 30 days of the final hearing on the appeal. Now, that was important because... Um, right, but that, I'm talking about the last sentence there. It says, the date of the approval of the minutes of the meeting at which the motion was made shall be... Um, the minutes of the meeting at which the motion should be the date of adoption. That's going to be 30 days out, and we change that, remember? Correct. So that shouldn't be there. So I, be that's the, why I wanted to bifurcate this, because I want to make sure we're approving the right thing here. The date of the approval of minutes of the meeting at which the motion was made shall be the date of adoption. That's wrong. That's not in the one I have. Right, that was changed. Well, and, that's what I'm saying. It was we emailed got, out to everybody. So and we got the wrong, wrong one wrong. is what I'm saying. Yeah, so that was, that I think was, that was an email on Monday, and it yeah. was emailed yeah. to the board. Okay. All right, well, I just want to make sure we, we know what we're voting on here. Right, so you're voting on the most recent yeah, copy that bad. was emailed to the board on Monday. Okay. I'm trying to figure out what bifurcate means. <laughs> okay. Cut the baby in half. Are we ready? <laughs> we got enough to, uh, adequate discussion, so we're going to vote on this motion. Favor. Did we get a second? I think Mr. Yes, I second. Tim. Okay, very good. Motion is made, seconded. Roll call vote. Mr. Price. Yes. Mr. Bartold. Yes. Mr. Martin. Yes. Mr. Kelly. Yes. Mr. Reininger. Aye. Good. We um, that puts that 
particular matter to bed. But the only comment I would make is one of the discussion items we had at the last meeting was to do work sessions. Wait, so yeah, just to clear, so we're not no, we're not we're doing gonna the go, we're going to go to the uh, the other part of the. Well, I, I don't know that. I mean, you you all just made a motion to uh, make changes to the bylaws, all of the all of the language, excepting that bit about abstentions. So I don't think that you need to make another motion. That's, saying, that's fine. Now, one one thing to keep in mind is that the um, issue related to resolutions versus motions will not go into effect immediately. It needs there needs to be a legislative change made to the zoning resolution. So I'll keep you apprised. That's that I'll start that process at the next meeting, and uh, I'll let you know when when it gets through the the zone text amendment process and get that taken care of. Okay. I'm going to put it back. Work sessions. Um, one of the comments that came through the emails was all members should be present, and uh, we would simply announce at like this meeting uh, a work session which would be open to the public, but would not require a court reporter necessarily or counsel. It's just kind of a discussion about issues that we need to resolve and clarify. Uh, I'm still uh, would like to pursue that, but not to get together just for the sake of holding hands, but to actually have some to discuss. I, I don't have an agenda for a work session at this point. Any of the board members do. Uh, we can either tack it on to the back end of a meeting or just come in uh, at a separate day. You know what a lot of a lot of places do if they're going to have you, you have your regular meeting that starts at seven and I don't know if that's because you all it's hard for you to get here before seven or if you do it for the public's convenience because a lot of people have trouble getting here before seven. But if you wanted to notice a work session before the meeting at 6.30, um, you, could, you just have to make sure you notice it and you have to make sure you take minutes just like you would have a regular public meeting. But that would be, you wouldn't need the court reporter until seven o'clock because that would be just a time to discuss issues. In fact, we could have discussed this issue about the abstentions at a work session such as that. You can do a motion, it can have the same effect as a regular meeting as long as you notice it properly and you take minutes etc thank you for the clarification no other issues so um, if, if you have items that you would like to be addressed on at a work session shoot me an email and we'll get it we'll get it on the agenda okay well I mean just out of curiosity I mean is that normally you would say hey tonight we've got five cases for next month Right. So if you came to us and said, hey, there's only one case for next month, maybe during those slow times right. would be an appropriate time to do a work session. That's but, what I was getting at in the response that I sent. I mean, I, there are enough meetings where we were out of here in 20 minutes that I, w I would think that instead of scheduling another obligation for the board that we pack it on to one of those meetings. I'm open. And you don't have to call it anything different. You could make it as part of the regular public meeting. We can still just talk in public, you know, at a regular public meeting. You don't have to say we're, and you can say if you want, okay, we're adjourning the regular meeting. Now we're going to going to go into a work session. But if you do that, you have to notice a work session. If you want to just have general discussion as part of your regular public meeting, you can certainly do that on an occasion where you only have one or two hearings if that's what you want to do. You just the only thing you have to be careful of is if you're going to have a work session, you have to notice it and you have to take minutes. So, so out of curiosity then, let's say that we had one case tonight, that we had, you know, another however long for this session, right? Would the court reporter have to be here after that? No. Okay, so once the, the cases are done, we close, you know, and... In fact, she doesn't have to be here now. The only reason you have the court reporter here... <laughs> the only reason you need a court reporter is... Testimony. If there's an appeal and we have to file a record... <coughs> we can just have the court reporter it's easy it's the best way to do it we have the court reporter type up the um, transcript of the hearings and then we file it as a record on appeal a lot of places don't have a court reporter they just do it from a tape and then you have to get a court reporter to, to listen to the tape and type it up it's better if she's here in person to do it but certainly she doesn't need to be taking down anything we discuss just for the hearings I'll ask for a motion to adjourn so moved Second. Anybody? Yes. Second. Okay. In favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you all.